and now I'd like to welcome President Elsner. <laughs> Sister told me it was really going to be a good prayer. She was, she was right. So, hey, today we have a new, I don't know if we've ever done it. We make a lot of mistakes, like any human organization. But it occurred to me more than once, and finally we did a little something about it. You know, we stand on the shoulders of a lot of people who worked really, really hard to build up our university. We always mention the sisters. But there was also a lot of other lay people that built it up. And so I wanted to be better about inviting them back to things. Now, we always invite them to things where you donate. That's no problem. <laughs> but today they didn't pay to get in. It's an open ticket, and we're going to have a little reception for them afterward. Would our maritime, long-term faculty and friends stand so we can applaud you today? Please, please, please. Professor Thank you. Okay. We were trying to think of an event, and this would be a little update. And I think Faith Plasson Craig was going to come by too. I don't know, I didn't see her yet, but maybe she's running late for class. So we won't ding her on her pay raise and promotion, okay? <laughs> she's already done. Is this one on also? Is that the problem? Stop it. Okay. So today we're going to do a presentation. Really, it's hope filled. It's full of challenges, but it's hope filled. Um, one thing then, and I, I, I learned this in athletics, I see Coach Henry there. Um, a great famous guy from Indiana called John, named John Wooden always said, you never look at your opponent in a competition as something to make you nervous, well maybe nervous would be all right, but you never hate him or treat him as an enemy. A challenge is your friend. It makes you a better steward. We do that in volleyball. That's how our national champion. So I see Coach there. We had to point her out and embarrass her a little. Yeah, there she is. Why don't you stand up? National championship. That was really impressive run, Coach. But you never, your your uh, opponents are never your enemy. They're your friends. They cause you to be a better steward of your talents, they focus you, they give you discipline, they cause you to want to be more innovative, you end up being better service to your own players and champion. So we're in this challenging environment, and my job as president is to keep track of some of that, you all do it too, but what's going on in the environment, where are we sitting? And I come today with a lot of hope, a lot of hope, um, excitement really about our future, but I'm also a realist. Um, so there's a, we could go on to, I, I had some help as I always do. I have pages of all your accomplishments. I'm gonna start reading, because sure enough, I'll leave somebody out, right? But I'll probably do it anyway. So, but I have an interesting experience. I've been here 19 years, what a wonderful thing. And this semester started off, Liz, and then, thank you, and, of course, uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Silva, our provost, really have put emphasis on quality teaching, and we had a lot of faculty really join in and make it a priority. And they had wonderful presentations, poster presentations, on all the innovation going on here in teaching and how we serve our students. Now, I often mention on occasion, when I'm not at a fundraising lunch, I eat lunch in the dining hall with students, typically, sometimes faculty too. And I always ask, tell me something interesting you learned today, or what's your favorite class this semester? And they'll just start gushing about this professor or what they're doing interesting in this class. That gives me hope. But one of the things that was most hope-filled, uh, there was five students who gave presentations to our faculty. So it was nice to the faculty sit down and be quiet and the students speak. We kind of reversed roles there. And they stood up and talked about, two of them for the Eclipse College, you know, so one of them talked about your teaching rubric, and, um, et cetera. So they were well-schooled in the discipline of teaching. Gracie Hamilton was one. She's also a son. Uh, Madeline Dexter, she's in the Eclipse Educators College. Keith Maine, he had two perspectives. One is he went here undergraduate in sciences, and now he's a first-year medical student. So he got to talk about 
those two perspectives of the faculty. Um, Cam Davison gave a great presentation. I've known Cam since really he was in high school. It's been so neat to see him present about the care and concern. He mentioned Sister Monica, I think you're here, about you helping him and his excitement about Marion. Uh, Blair Kramer spoke. And to hear the students on a formal basis, they were all prepared, by the way, their presentations. I think one of them was a speech major, but she, she came across very well. Um, about the kind of commitment, the innovation, the passion, driving an hour and a half to see them do something great outside of normal class time, the kind of commitment. It was a complete affirmation to talk about creating hope. I mean, uh, Dr. Silva, you made a great presentation too. I don't want to leave you out. Some of our faculty also talked about their teaching and the different populations and how we did it. But it was really having your eyes open and seeing. It was really wonderful and was a way to kick off the semester. Because frankly, in the challenging environment we're in, it would be, um, you can't just be a college or university and do well. It just won't work. You'll have to be distinctive and excellence, and we're going to give a little update on that today. I was uh, looking at a recent article, and I think I have the material here because I didn't memorize it good. I do. Interesting thing here. There's, there's going to be a 9% drop in traditional college age students. So if you think It's a bigger deal than that, though. About 15, they predict 15% less students will go to college between the drop and students going more into trades and doing different things. So the population pool after 9-11, now we have some students here now from 9-11. That's when I started. This is a little scary. That was the year I started out as president. But then we had the Great Recession, et cetera. So, and then more students are not going to go to college. It's probably a good thing. And then, if you look at our place, we'll never be able to compete on price. We'll never be able to say, hey, this is the cheapest place to go. Cheapest and easiest we'll, won't get us to either. So you really have to stand out. Moody's, who studies this stuff um, all the time, predicts with great confidence, they think at least 15 small colleges per year in our country will close over the next 10 years. You've seen the number in the paper. Those, those ones that will close will have a revenue of less than $100 million. Now for our maritime faculty, when I started our budget was $15 million. It's $115 million today, so I was glad to be over the $100 million bar. It makes us a little less vulnerable. I, kept, I wanted to keep reading at that point. They also say a number of smaller public institutions will close. They'll just close them under $200 million revenue. If you have under 2,000 students, you're vulnerable. That was interesting to me. Um, the colleges that make it, right now, the colleges sitting really well financially and able to invest in their facilities and their faculty and their staff and their student are heavily endowed. Right now, we're the 20th best endowed institution in the state of Indiana. That's, at, of course, Notre Dame's like got the, as much as all the rest of us, but. Then there's IU, no, Purdue, and then IU, then Ball State, and then there's some of the big privates. But if you go all the way down, the public's and the privates, we're 20th. Well, in 2002, we had $2.9 million endowment, and now we're real close to $100 million. So we're making nice progress, because during that same time, we've put probably $150 million in new buildings. So we're, you know, why do I have hope? Well, it's a challenging environment, but I like, I like the guy coming up fast towards the finish line, not the one that's slowing down. And we're certainly doing that. So that was a good thing. But if you look at it, the other ones that are doing well have expanded and mixed their income. They're doing adult. They're doing online. They have other enterprises going. They're, they're trying to feed the beast in a couple ways. The third thing that universities are doing that are making progress, they've been able to attract resources through development and fundraising. And we would be an outlier. We've been averaging 20 to $25 million a year in new pledges and commitments. So that puts us, that's why we've been able to do all these things at once. So I come to you with a challenging environment. Don't kid yourself. 
we shouldn't kid one another, right? This isn't like business as usual, we'll get this well, we'll just keep on doing what we're doing, everything will be fine. It's actually a time to say, how can we be the best of what we do? How can we be more innovative? How do we expand? Where do we go? What's going to be the picture going forward? And, you know, there's a lot of, I know that sometimes, maybe I'm going to self disclose here, but well, we've already done a lot. Can't we kind of just like take a breath a little bit every once in a while? But I don't think it'd be a good time to do that. Um, I kind of learned that in athletics. If you have a really big win one weekend, and you say, hey, this year we'll go from practice, what usually happens that next weekend? You become real humble, and you have a loss, typically. So we've got to stay, and we've got a ton of talent. We're in a great city. We have a distinctive mission, and so we've got to keep going. Now, this is, uh, reveals some of my Nebraska roots. roots. Williams, Jennings, Bryan, did you know he's Nebraska? Well, you should know that. <laughs> Sister Mary Beth, I'm shocked. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, because that's what shocked me. Now, that doesn't shock me, Gene. <laughs> okay, that's not very nice, is it, Gene? I would never be a good campus minister, would I? No, I'm just not affirming enough. Destiny is no matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, it's not a thing to be waited for, it's a thing to be achieved. And I think we have a tradition of that, and we have a pace of it, and so onward. A brief update, um, some of you folks, we have five power goals, it really doesn't change. Uh, pillar one, we focus a lot on what do we do every day to defend what we're about. Do it better every day, continuous improvement, incremental places, where we keep getting better. We, we have a little update, a few things on there. These are things that by 2025 we want to do, and these are things that by 2029 we want to look into and keep expanding. And so our first is always mission identity. When we talk about distinctiveness, for believers, non-believers, and everybody in between, the gospel values, the life and call of Jesus Christ is powerful. Frankly, when I hear students speak about the commitment of their faculty, whether they're faculty or believers or not, the spirit of the gospel is alive and well here. It's other-centered. How do I serve better? How do I build community with others? How steel sharpens steel? It's Matthew, I don't know, well, someone knows the scripture here. But together you can, pardon? Somebody knows? Pardon? Yeah, Eugenie does know that. But together, <coughs> what we've done is form co a community that's committed on service that derives from the gospel values and that idea that every person in Catholic social teaching, you have inherent worth. You don't earn it. You have inherent worth. You do not earn it. By and large, almost without exception, and usually in great vivid color, Students will talk about manifestations of that in our community. Staff, faculty, coaches. If you want to listen to a good speech, listen to Coach Henniger's speech to the team after the national championship game, which ended a little bit short for us. We just needed a couple more minutes. I don't know if you know this, Coach, but I was up in the press box and there was a Grambling State University policeman, and I called him over. I said, I need you to tend to somebody. I'd like you to arrest him. He looked at me kind of shocked. I said, those guys in the striped shirt down there, the headlines, well, I'd like you to get that one and get them out of there real quick. At first he thought I was like serious, but I said, no, I'm really joking. I'm like, Coach, you would have liked that, get that guy out of there. He missed a couple calls. So this year, you know, I was like, you know the best one was Sister Norman yelling at the rats. Don't you miss that? We should have recorded some of those and just played it when the rats come off there. But this little 99 pound man yelling at the rats. Oh. Well, we try to always remember the dignity of every human person, but we, none of us are going to bat a thousand. The, the, the project with the St. John's Bible has been a wonderful thing. Um, Dr. Nelson, we've had a lot of the schools in, we've had a lot of places we've used it. I gave the prayer at the big chamber dinner, 2,000 people there, and, and the national speakers all used the St. John's Bible background. It's been a wonderful project.
just another example of progress in our mission and identity. Uh, by the way, Ed and Peggy Benach uh, helped pay for that this year. To own the thing forever in perpetuity is 165000 and and uh, Ed just and Peggy just agreed a couple of weeks ago to go ahead and help us have that permit. So we're going to have all of them go out here permanently. So that's going to be good. Sister Jean helped get that going on there, Beth, and a lot of people have done great work there. Um, really working on faculty staff formation. It's hard to give the distinctiveness of our mission needs to be fed. It's hard to give something or share something that we don't form and encourage intellectually and as a community what we believe. And we're going to try to put more and more effort in formation and feeding of our mission. Um, Adam Settler, Sister Mary Best involved, and others. And we're getting, uh, we're, we'll constantly do this, invite people to explore their faith, how they live it out here on campus, how it manifests in the values and what we do. We'll continue to work on religious art. There's going to be some beautiful religious art in the new uh, um, kind of Wagner Hall, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, the Sondheim Scholars have been a great deal. We've been doing this now for, what, 18 years? And we said, let's double down on that. So we'll have some nice, nice growth on that this year. Uh, right now, I got a report that we have 128 applicants. Some here from Sonoma, am I about right? 124. And we've interviewed uh, close to 100. Last year, we only interviewed 92. I was here on the uh, Accept a Student for the Interview Day. Really impressive students and parents. And we're going to go from 46 to 62, and I have confidence. That will keep going. We invest a lot in this program and we'll continue to do so. Excellent students, excellent leaders, and they manifest our mission in every way. The second one is academic quality. Again, we have a pillar where we're continuous improvement, things like you know, working on the exchange and career development, our retention programs, which have a lot to do with academic quality. We'll keep that moving. The a second column, and I'll mention in a minute, for instance, we're going to have another doctoral program next year in leadership. It's well designed, and Eclipse College put it together. Um, the Dr. Jeffs are somewhere around here, <laughs> Jeff Square, but uh, they're moving this program along. And then we have some things uh, growth and degrees offered, professional development online to serve six to 10,000 students. We won't do that next year, but long term, we're going, to, we're going to be not only good at fundraising, but we're going to develop other populations of revenue growth around, and, and mission growth around this institution. Expansion of medical school and different things we're going to do there. Uh, faculty and staff uh, scholarship. I, I have a whole list of different research projects. You see us being published. You see us in the newspaper, newspaper by David. And, and uh, Dr. Hisman, we talk about observation and how we do questioning. And it's uh, every part of the universities. Uh, Dr. We're just shy of 200 professors now, mm -hmm. full time, uh, which is a tripling, really. Uh, probably a little bit more, but it is at least a tripling over the last uh, 18 years of the faculty, which is awesome. Um, did you notice the pattern? Uh, Wendy and the exchange and Ellen Witt, and we keep encouraging students, look, at, you can be a Fulbright Scholar. Last couple of years we've had two a year, we have three finalists here, semi-finalists, four fellows, we have two, one, two, three, every year now there's a pattern emerging. We have a, a, a student applying for a Rhodes Scholarship. We can't be too involved in that, <coughs> tighten up the rules on that. It seems some Rhodes Scholars were having their applications done by professors, and then, but, so they've been tightening up on how you can be involved, so we're doing it the right way. We are highly ethical here. But you see academic quality and challenge your students to be in top schools. And you know, I, I had an interesting a couple of visits. As a matter of fact, I brought one of these emails, and I did ask this lady, I said, do I have permission to share it? And I didn't say it to the whole faculty and staff, but she said I could share it. So this nice lady writes me. Her name is Dr. Linda Spinetti. She's with the uh, university in assessment out in North Carolina. 
She says, my son, Michael Nugs, is preparing to graduate from the Moon College. That's good. Well, anytime you get these e emails, you get a little nervous. <laughs> like, you know, why did you charge so damn much or something? Well, I started reading this and I got pretty excited. And so she says, uh, she, uh, it, by the way, was addressed to myself and Dr. Sefci. Your thoughtfully designed curriculum and creative use of instruction at Valley focus on student success, most especially the dedicated, caring, passionate faculty and staff in the time that enabled Michael to blossom. She goes on to tell me during her, the young person's undergraduate years at Marion North, some of you newcomers, that's not her name. Um, she said he was just kind of lost in thousands of students. But at Marion, you find people who care and help you, give you a wealth of resources to meet your need. Michael's now graduating. His board exams and the DO board exams were in the top five percentile. <coughs> In the MD exam, top 15 percentile, he's been invited to 24 residency interviews. Of course, you'll have to pick through those and not do them. Well. In one of his third and fourth year rotations that he was doing, I won't read the whole thing. This is a woman, a mother knows a lot, but it's also a mother who's involved in higher ed assessment. And she just goes on, this is a special place, and I just wanted you to know it. And, and I had another conversation with a student who graduated from Harvard who's in the med school. And she just wrote me a handwritten note about, I've never been in such a place where people care about my success like this place. So I had a cup of coffee with her the other day. I, I brought her a coffee cup. But she already had her coffee ahead of me. But she did take the cup. <laughs> students will take anything free. <laughs> By the way, I'm, the students that presented the faculty, I offered them a present. They were over in my office where I had them on the desk. A freebie, they like that. But consistently, we're finding students from great backgrounds, from high schools and colleges and universities coming here, and they're finding something special about what we have. That's why I told them. But we've got to keep enriching it and moving with it. But these students are competing against people from universities all over the country to get these designations, and they're being selected. Our STEM plan will be a big push going forward. We had a whole series of seminars with community leaders in STEM, and they didn't say STEM or liberal arts, they said combine them. The people who hire people in the medical professions and sciences <coughs> want folks that can think and innovate and write. But Dr. Leckbatter, could you just give us people that can write a paragraph? We would appreciate it. Do they have people with all sorts of talents? Can they communicate? Do they know how to listen? It isn't either or here, it's got to be both and. It's got to be both and. So we have a lot going on there, and we'll make investments there, because that's where things are moving with her. We're gonna, we have computer science moving. We have to have a science in pre-med. It's going to double, double chemistry. We have great professors. We have to keep it going. We'll do that in graduate also. I talked about our doctor of educational leadership. Dr. Brett, how many applications are in question area have for that? Sixty. And you're gonna have the first cohort's gonna be how big? Sixteen. Sixteen. I keep saying twenty-four. <laughs> 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 I'm willing you to slip up today. <laughs> we gotta go all right. <laughs> I'm gonna let him off from everybody. We uh, Dr. Silva's gonna get with a group of people put together a, some kind of an arts plan that would make a unique contribution to Marion academically in our community life here. We're gonna make some investments there. We've had some initial conversations with possible donors, they need a plan. How will it work, enrollment, financial, et cetera. It's a place where we haven't been able to do a lot, we need to make a move. It's time. It's time for us to do that here. Oh, by the way, I told Dr. Malone, look at that guy right there. <laughs> That's our math chair. The guy's got a voice. Stand up, Dr. Wall. Let's give him some good hand. And you know, that means a lot to the students. I heard him, hey, we were sitting up there when we met during the, oh, they were all excited about Dr. Wall being in this. And I think they came. That's one reason they did it. They wanted to see if a math professor could act. <laughs> it appears he can. He was really good, actually. The whole thing was really great. So Ben had a good job. Keep it up, and we're going to build on that. Uh, St. Joe Indy, you know, pilot group, 
We have a lot of people cheering for us on this. The European model, earn and learn, 12 months, different design, different cohort of students. Um, I suspect we'll at least double our enrollment next year, and we'd really like to be closer to 100, right? Okay. <laughs> we have uh, two year apps now. Last year at this time, we had much less than that, so we're getting rolling there. But we, we see this, and I'll talk more about this, a network of highly effective two-year colleges. I see she left there, one of our great professors there. We have a good group of folks over there, and we're going to do some great things there. So that's moving. We've raised, uh, what the community has given us, almost $4 million now, Joe? For three and a half, yeah. Three and a half, so we're making progress. It's some startup funds, and we have some other good lines in the water, so to speak. We think we'll be pulling some big fish in the boat. This is about leadership, our whole vision. Educate transformational leaders. Students, be a transformational leadership influence in the professions, healthcare, education, business, church, and other not and be an institutional beacon witness of leadership in advancing the common good. A lot of what we do here, the service projects, etc. I believe universities, one thing that will hold university and college back in public perception and reality is when they close in on themselves. Our faculty, staff, students learn more in the world by doing a combination of what we do here in classrooms and in study and engaging with the world. Isolated universities are in jeopardy. You have to be involved in the world. Um, I think I might be talking about leadership, and I really should be talking about enrollment, but that's okay. <coughs> when I talk about leadership, well, last year our yield went down. So you had accepted students at a record level, and we yielded about 24%. That can't be. If we close, you know, we had, what, 424 students, first time, full time. Now, we took in about the last few years, 1,000 new students. <coughs> With the transfers, new <coughs> students, two-year college students now, graduate students, med students. If you go the whole gamut, secondary nursing students. I mean, we just did, we graduated 900 or something, too, though. So you better be doing that, right? You got you to gotta keep going. Um, I didn't do the toothpaste, that was Mark Apple, but anyway, um, I don't really like it. <laughs> this, is not a this is not a toothpaste business. I probably said it. But anyway, I wanted something more sophisticated. These are PhDs and stuff. Right? The, uh, <laughs> we needed something more sophisticated, okay? But anyway, we can't leave that many people interested in Marion we got to bring them in, okay? And that's everybody. That's a tactical thing, whether we use, engage the students in that process, faculty, staff, the students, uh, interesting students, let's go get them and close the deal with them. That will help us a lot this year. The future, uh, we have grandchildren now getting all sorts of stuff from colleges after they take PSAT. Some of our students get me all those brochures and emails and texts. We would really like to start to be more systematic about building a pipeline in America, where they start knowing about our program, our professors, our place, our research, what we're doing in the world, so that by the time they get ready for college, we're the choice of one or two or three that they're really passionate about. We don't want to talk students into coming here. We want them to be here badly. We'd rather have 500 seats and have 600 want to be here with 100 with a waiting a letter of the okay, we'll hopefully squeeze you in here. And you got to build pipelines. We do it well with 21st Century Scholars, one of the best 21st Century Scholar program in the state. It probably is the best. We'll just say it's the best. It's Kayla here. It's the best. <laughs> The Missionary Disciples Institute is held this summer. A big percent of those students then apply to be Sondoms. Did you guys see your picture up there? Are you, I saw you giggling. Are your picture up there? So you're or your friends? Well, that's kind of exciting. At least you can tell your friends. Um, the other way that you have to move and do new programs, whether it's EDD, we're going to be teaching in Oklahoma. See now we have a second degree in nursing in North Indianapolis, and we have one in Nashville. 
Those programs right now are documenting about $7 million in revenue. We didn't have those not that many years ago. We probably can double that in the next four years and have $14 million in revenue, expand our mission. There's a big nursing shortage. We know how to do that with a clinical partner. A good clinical partner, you can expand your mission and do your work, and it really helps because we don't have a billion dollar endowment, we have to be entrepreneurs. We can't sit and wait. Expand your mission, expand your revenue, and your, your influence in the world. The difference you make. Now we're on leadership. Thank you. Um, I talked about leadership, educating, forming leaders as graduates, our influence in the professions, and advancing the. Oh, look at there, Ellen. Now, we, when people say, what's a leader made of and what do we focus on, the first thing is trustworthiness, ethics. We've got the Ethics Center up and rolling. Things are moving along there. We'll keep expanding that. We're doing our uh, search for the similar chair in ethics. And we have good candidates. We see great possibilities there. It, the, the leadership issue with trustworthiness, ethics is big. Healthy approach to life, spiritual, metaphysical, etc. cetera, so Inquisitive mind, good, solid, liberal arts education, where you're inquisitive, how do we do things better, how do we serve better, and of course, all the skills that come with leadership. What could be what Dr. Lecklider said, they give me write a paragraph, you know, that'd be a good start. Um, we have a number of our, uh, we have our first cohort of in, uh, Mary Leeds, is that what we call them? Emily. I got to speak to that class, it was really great. Enjoyed it, and this is the first uh, guinea pig cohort of this. And we're going off some of our beliefs. Uh, the chief's in there, so everybody behaved well, right, chief? I was bugging the chief earlier, and he started to pull his taser out. So I wanted to be more respectful of you. But, the, but this is gonna be a constant thing. We're gonna try to keep putting a lot of people in different leadership programs. The basic philosophy here is what we have as faculty staff, will come across to the students. We'll come across to the programs we need. Uh, we're, we're getting some people involved in some national and regional leadership programs as well. And I, I thank those people that have signed up. And we'll be reaching out after our first pilot program, MU Leads, looking for more candidates and we'll build up that program. We want to keep forming and teaching one another in excellence in leadership. How is it you live a trustworthy, ethical, rules of professional modeling. How is it you live a healthy, balanced life and approach to life? How is it you show inquisitiveness and innovation and looking for better ways? What are the skills of a leader that they come across? We can preach about leadership all day long <coughs> to live it. Um, and we did this in a lot of areas. I'm looking at some of our folks that have been around here for years. So we have folks involved. We're going to keep nominating folks. and. Congratulations to those folks who have been accepted into those programs that are outside of Mary. Um, oh, yeah, and then our students. We encourage your students. February 8th is a sign up. Um, last couple of years, I've gone to it every year. We get students, and somebody I noticed last year, I think, Coach, you sent a bunch of young men over, and we have good presenters, and it's a good way to gather folks around our students around the idea of what is a leader and how does it make a difference in your life in your team, in your dorm, where you live and work, and in your community, February 8th. So if you know some students, uh, encourage them to be part of that. It, it'll be well done. Uh, we are the champions. That's a good song. Uh, let's, let's look at that. Uh, Steve John, did they do that article we did? They're doing an article on our, our athletic director. And, and I got I got the last word on you. I told the report. I talked to him a long time, but anyway, told some stories that are all true. But really, I embellished. So, but you think about the, maybe the best athletic director. Why don't you stand up, Steve? You're not hard to see. Yet. We all see the scoreboard and like it, but we pay attention to retention rates, graduation rates, student study hall, doing the right things. I mean, that's really our success 
is really a result of doing a whole bunch of other things right in the beginning, picking great coaches. And so I, we have among our, our ranks here really an outstanding athletic department, and it's because of leadership, the AD and the coaches. We're, we're doing things that are making a difference with young people, and then it shows up on the national scene. It's no surprise. So congratulations to all those good folks. Soccer had a great team, obviously. Cycling continues to do what they do. Um, it's a good place to teach leadership. Uh, expanding resources. So um, we're financially solid, but I don't want to go into the future. We need to be a lot better. And let me share what I'm thinking, or we're thinking in the board. <clears throat> I said our endowment's approaching 100 million, which is nice. It does put us around 20th in the state. We really think we need to work very hard as soon as possible to get at that 150 million. There's some metrics they share on the national level of what you want to have in usable assets compared to what you have in debt to so forth. So what we want to do is take our bond debt, which is really the reason we carry a lot of bond debt, the interest rates are so low. You're better off not putting all the money you get from donors into the building. You're almost better off because of inflation, et cetera. When you borrow money at 3%, it's been a good strategy. But we like to get our balance sheet where this number is at about 1.5 or 150 million, and this number is 100. The next five years, we'd like to get that done. It's going to take a lot of discipline and tremendous fundraising. But that way, if there's an up and down in the economy or a place you want to invest, expand, you have the resources. Right now, we're pretty levered, and we don't have a lot of wiggle room. Where there's not you know, money just to it. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to, um, one of the big challenges in doing that, the next three years, we'll put about 35 to $40 million in new facilities, either redoing the facilities we have or new buildings, the big new building we're building. Why do you build another building if you want to get your endowment up? You can't really grow your class size. You have to have scale to make it in the in a modern higher ed. You can't really build class size with Doyle Hall alone. It's, it's 1960s building, painted and repainted in new toilets. But we haven't done a lot in there. And so we have to have more room if we're going to go ahead and move forward with our plan. That's, and I'll show you, well, that's a $50 million building. So you'll see our total net assets have done quite well. So we're expanding, we're making things work, but we're still a little, little on the edge. And I'd like to get the institution, one of my big goals in work with the board and donors and our staff is to get this, just think about this at 150, and this will pay down in the next four years to right around 100. So this isn't going to be as hard. We, pay, we make our mortgage payments well, bond payments. This one is we have to keep, if there's a dollar laying there, there's so many scrumptious things to spend it on, it's hard to put it in the endowment. But you, you want a better balance sheet, we're going to work hard with that. And I showed you our revenue and how we're growing it. And that puts us, that gives us the kind of scale you need as well. Um, our forging leader campaign, I think we're at $130 million a day. We had a nice call today, this morning, John and I did. So we wanted to be, by 2021, 150. We'd really like to be in excess of $150 million in this year. And we have reason to believe we'll do it. So then we're going to say, well, our goal was too low. And our new goal, whoopsie, back up. Our new goal we'd like to announce this year is that we'd like to put a $250 million goal and give us a few more years to get there. That would be that endowment money some new program money, and some scholarship money in there, okay, and some facility. So we're going to hopefully say a prayer, be generous in your own right. We'd like to really be looking at that. By 2029, really, that gave us an extra year. By 2029, we'd like to be a $500 million fundraising total. And that will take our endowment up further and help us with the new facilities. So those are the kind of ambitious goals we're talking about. For our university size, that's over on the edge. But prayer, keep doing great things, be different, be uniquely Catholic, faith-based institution, high academic quality, great community, serve people who actually need to be served. 
not just help the privileged and become more privileged. If you do those kind of things, people will invest. That's been our experience. It hasn't for the last 15 years. We're making progress. So we're gonna, those are ambitious, but that's what it'll take to really put our university in, a, in an advantageous place. Uh, alumni engagement's a big effort. Our alumni don't participate in our university quite the level we like. It doesn't compare to the top universities. Top universities, their alums are rabid fans of their institution, kind of like Marion North. All those, their percent of giving is a lot higher than ours. We want to be there. We want to be there. They help hire, help mentorship, help recruit students. We're going to engage our alumni at a much higher level. And we have a lot of young alums because we grew so much, right? And they're very busy. They're having babies and doing all sorts of things. It keeps you busy. But we still have to get them here. And we have to get them to have a big part of this thing. They'll make our future. We, we have great things going on. We just want to do more. Um, Kyle Wagner Hall, isn't that beautiful? Now, hey, by the way, somebody asked about, <coughs> see the bell tower? That's going to be the highest place on campus. And I think you can control the bell from your phone. I'm going to have it in my phone. Like, if we get a big, a big play on the football field, I'm going to ring that hell up. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. If someone gets a research project published, I'm going to ring that bell. It's a half-ton bell. But anyway, some people asked about the donor. Now, we had a real good donor that gave more than that cost. But we also asked the architect. He said, you know, you need a stairwell here. And that's when it occurred to me, well, if you made it a little higher, we could put a bill up there. He said, well, sure, you can do that, because you've got to have a stairwell anyway. So it, does, it isn't as expensive as it looks. And plus, there's a donor that just got tears in his eyes thinking about it, because his grandpa built the bell tire on it at Holy Rosary Parish. You ever seen that one down there? But this is a lot bigger. So I said, they'll be bigger than right? But anyway. We're going to have that in a beautiful St. Joseph Chapel. This is Old Dirk Hall, and that is uh, Drew Hall. So it'll be right in there. It will lose some parking, but we have a plan for that. And this will look like a front. So that's going to be a beautiful thing with a garden back here. Another, it'll be kind of an icon. When you drive up, you'll see it. And we will ring it on special occasions. So it's going to be really nice. 200 some students will be there. That'll give us some opening in Doyle. And so the next few years, you'll see Doyle all get renovated. So we'll have two beautiful facilities for our first time full time. We better keep raising money, right? Uh, model community. The key here, I love facilities. You need, it, you need an endowment. You need to do all the business things. But everything we do here that makes us distinctive is people. So how do you, we, we worked on our engagement survey. A lot of people did great things this year about engagement. We're going to form a task force. What does a model work life community look like? What are the kind of things we're doing well, do more of? What are the kind of things over the years as we build our resources we can do more of? To enrich the opportunity to attract top talent and to keep it all for our, you know, our students and our mission. Because people depend on us. So we're going to keep doing things in that area that uh, make a difference and make investments. We've already made some changes, and we're going to keep doing that. We're going to stay on it. There's no way you can build a great Catholic university without tremendous faculty and staff. That's what it takes. Innovative, hardworking, disciplined, mission-driven people. Every corner of the place. And they have to be invested in and they invest back, it's a virtuous circle. We're going to work much harder on that. We're moving it. If we do well, what we, what we say we're doing, we'll have, the, we'll have the resources to do this. And then that will just help us grow faster and better. Um, big deal going on, Lily Endowment. We've been invited by Lily to invite. There's three grants. One is charting the future of higher ed. Eli Lilly sees the challenges and the demographics and all. And they're looking for innovative proposals. They'll invest $11, $12 million in an innovative proposal to move higher ed forward, to create scale and sustainability. We're very interested in that, right? We're working hard on that. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Another big grant that they'll put millions in is enhancing opportunities in Marion County. Now, I've mentioned this before. 
working for the common good, it's hard to say we're working for the common good and keep our head down when a high percent of people in Marion County live under poverty level. In America, it doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a whole bunch of other people in Marion County, and I have all the percentages, just above the poverty level. They're one car wreck away from living in the poverty. And it mirrors quite closely your educational attainment level. Guess what? Our mission calls us to do something about that, and we're in the education business. We're developing a proposal about driving educational attainment up on the west side. We're going to focus. Say a prayer on these big ones. We're also um, going to put together on thriving congregations, and especially with the changing populations and Latino parishes, etc. We can get a very nice sized grant from Lily in that regard. All of them are about leadership, right? The charting futures. Grant, I think it might have the Mary's response, okay. On the charting future, we're really going to make sure that how do you have more students access higher ed and find success? Employment, graduation, all the things we expect. Um, how do you make sure, especially key populations that are sitting in too much poverty or just out of poverty are in the game? We like our two-year college, we like our 21st century scholar program, some of the things we're doing makes us perfectly suited, and we live here in the west side. And then all of it should help us achieve greater scale. So last year, our total number of students served was 4,500. If we do well in these projects in the next four, five, six years, we'll be serving six, seven, and 8,000 students by the time you think of online and a network of two-year colleges and Marion College's main campus growing. That puts you in a position to be a better service to society and your students and makes you sustainable financially. So those are the three focus of what we're going to talk to Lily about. Um, we're putting in proposals in March and April and then they get back to us and just pray. We have a number of people involved that we secure those. And boy, we can make a big difference. This is the charting the future. I want to show you this picture. Uh, Lily wants you to look at collaborative approaches to build this scale and sustainability. So we've had conversations with students in health, that's in its early stages, about embedding a two-year college right in the healthcare system on the north side. They have bus lines there, you could work half time, go to school half time, good paying job with benefits and healthcare. Interesting. Uh, we didn't put this one up here, oh there's Westfield. That really, I don't know how it got down there. It should be a <laughs> That's Mark also. <laughs> I take credit and give one to you. So Westfield built a big YMCA, say that's how it's going to put a health care center in there, a daycare center. Hey, we, we could put a two-year college in there. Very interested. We've had our discussions. I think we had our discussions with them today. I haven't heard a report on it. Very promising. With online education and building small we're not, we're not going to pay for the buildings, okay? We're not going to go into a bunch of debt on this. We're going to partner with people. The healthcare system needs workers. We educate. We can put professors and some online and uh, facilitators of learning in these different places. This is all scale. And Silla College has, has asked us to be, their preferred future is with a bigger university. It's going to be hard to make it alone with 400 students, 500, right? And so we've entered, we will enter serious discussions now on the details of it, mission, sponsorship, governance, finances, all that. And their big part of asking Lily, could they become partner with us? And some of their early grant would help what I call de-risk the deal. Because we can't take on debts and challenges. But if you had two year, a network of two-year colleges that eventually feed into Marion, graduate program center when we start expanding that way and use technology to help do it. Uh, St. Joe Calumet doesn't have a nursing program, so they're working with us on an ideal where we would, they keep running their shop, we put a nursing program in there with them for undergraduates and adults. By the way, this two-year college kind of interesting. I haven't talked to Steve and the coaches. They have an athletic program. I did ask them if they want to play some football up there, but I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know, they're a little scared. <coughs> Me too. But anyway, they're in this uh, Michigan conference of Judos. I don't even know if they play football, but uh, Rensselaer continues to talk to us. They have empty buildings, and we talked to the Economic Regional Development Corporation up there. They'd love to have some higher ed in the area. So you, you kind of see a funnel towards the region. You could do some things southeast on 74, and between 74 and 70. There's, you know, of course, we have a few friends in Oldenburg and that kind of thing. So once we get the template down, we think we can start, we'll do some things from the main university, but between online, et cetera, we, we think we can create scale and make a bigger difference. And that'll help feed the mothership as well. Enhancing the opportunity, Clips College is going to take the lead in building educational attainment. We'll integrate our Latino initiative, some distance learning, of course, the STEM plan. Where's the big employment going to be in the future? We're going to have to help prepare populations that are not participating in STEM well-paid areas and get them ready for that, working with the grade schools and high schools and community groups. And of course, St. Joe Indy will be a big part of that. I see people leaving, so I better shut up. <laughs> so we're doing budgeting this year. We're going to ask one thing we cannot do if we're going to put money in STEM and arts, if we have programs here that cannot secure enrollment that pays tuition, you can't keep running them. We're going to have to either provide an innovative, exciting program that people will actually apply and go to, or redirect these resources to things that are or can grow. And so we're going to be good stewards. We're going to figure out how to do that. And so we're going to work hard on that this year and every year. Uh, Dr. Silva, we're the deans and faculty program and curriculum review. Where can we double and triple down to grow? I think in even now we have 800 nursing students. I think something like that. Well, what do we have, what, six, seven, eight years ago? Well, at one time, I know we had around 200. In my, in, in not that far ago. So where can we double down and really grow and put resources there and make a difference? And where, where can we not sustain that excellent program? So we're going to work together on that. Um, I'll go back to my Nebraska guy. Nebraska. Yeah, there you go. He's from Nebraska. So you, 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 you can learn. Any questions? I think I might have gone over time. That's why we have hope. We have a clear plan. We have to keep going. Of course, we'll always be together. Uh, I don't know what our time frame is. I didn't do it in a while. We're out of time. So if you have any questions, just catch me whenever you can or someone else. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate you being here. Sorry I went a little long. Sisters, we do have a question. Yes, go ahead. You asked us to be the best student that we can be. Mm -hmm. And none of us here want any less than that. I agree. In order for us to build more, yep. our foundation, which is Marion University, in Indianapolis. Absolutely. Has got to be a strong foundation. No doubt. My concern is that we continue to bring innovation. My fear is it's at the cost of excellence. Mm -hmm. So I would like to get some information about what is St. Joe's Indy, how are they doing? I know the building will hold 100 students. My question to the faculty and staff is, are they sufficiently supporting 100 students? Do they have enough? What about Cliffs Educators College? That's a relatively new innovation. I would like to see some report on that as well. <coughs> the other thing that concerns me is that we use the idea of the wagon. We can't push and pull at the same time. You are pulling us apart. How's that pulling apart? What do you mean by that? We have to push ahead, but we are being pulled behind by the things that we are expected to be doing. One of our branding issues is you will be challenged academically but our faculty will support you. Mm -hmm. We have two new hires. We can't even suggest to them where their office might be. We will not begin to take them 
to a math lab. I have been here almost four decades. The first thing I asked for was could we have a math lab? If our STEM initiative is truly to be the STEM program we wish it to be, and we're going to be working with underrepresented populations, we have got to have a state-of-the-art math lab. We have a speaking center, we have a writing lab, a writing center, both are wonderful pieces, but they are directed by someone who is trained in that profession. So we need a math lab? With this more than four white tables, yes sir. Okay, well good, let's do it. Can I ask Randy to come? <laughs> 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 well, you know, there is progress because we do, we do have a math lab, but you don't think it's up to where we need to take it. Have you seen it? <laughs> I, I just stated a fact. You don't think it's where it needs to be. So I now you want to improve it. Have you seen it? I am not too sure I have. I hmm. want you to look at it and see if you would invite okay. one of your children or grandchildren to see that as the math lab at Mary. Well, the only thing I would tell you is... Those are all good things, by the way. We have to get better at everything. When you grow, you have more financial resources to do this. Look at our retention rate. I mean, I think this, from first semester, second semester, we're... Remember that I wouldn't miss? Yeah. 95.8. We must be doing something pretty well. This is a record, 95.8. Are we going to rest? I, I did not rest. I, I don't know if you noticed, but I don't rest. But we can't do everything at once. And, and you know the other thing we need to do, sister, is what I said about reallocating resources. So if there's places we want to get better, let's figure out how to do it. We raise money, maybe reallocate resources, but we absolutely always have to pay attention to quality. And maybe if we're doing too much, what do you scale back so that we can grow? Dr. Mutachi, were you leaving or no. say something? Stretching my legs. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear yeah. But I, I don't mind that at all. We need to absolutely have quality and work hard at it. I think we can take great pride in a lot of things we're doing. There's more to do. And we'll do it. Okay? Together. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.